At this time, uh, Damon will come forward and uh, read our scripture. I'd like everybody to stand and remain standing for the prayer. Morning. The scripture reading this morning is Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. Your attitude should be the same as that of, Jesus, of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you so much for allowing us to be out here today. Father, we ask that you just look over us and guide us. Father, we ask you bless this service. We ask that it be taken out into the world. Father, we just ask that what we do and say be for your honor and glory. Forgive us where we fail you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our first hymn is 147, Jesus Hold My Hand, verses 1 and 3. As I travel through this pilgrim land, there is a friend who walks with me. Leads me safely through the sinking sand. It is the Christ of Calvary. This would be my prayer, dear Lord, each day to help me do the best I can. For I need thy light to guide me day and night. Blessed Jesus, hold my hand. Blessed Jesus, hold my hand. Yes, I need thee every hour. Through this land, this pilgrim land, by thy saving power. Hear my plea, my feeble plea. Lord, dear Lord, look down on me. When I kneel in prayer, blessed Jesus, hold my hand. When I wander through the valley, dim toward the setting of the sun, Lead me safely to a land of rest, if I a crown of life have won. I have put my faith in thee, dear Lord, that I may reach the golden strand. There's no other friend on whom I can depend. Blessed Jesus, hold my hand. Blessed Jesus, hold my hand. Yes, I need thee every hour. Through this land, this pilgrim land, by thy saving power hear my plea my feeble plea lord dear lord look down on me when i kneel in prayer blessed jesus hold my hand 
as we prepare for our communion, if you're here this morning and wish to partake with us uh, and did not yet receive your communion kit at the door, if you'll raise your hand, it will be brought to your seat at this time. We're going to use all three stanzas of Must Jesus Bear the Cross Alone. Must Jesus bear the cross alone and all the world go free? No, there's a cross for shall set me free and then go home my crown to wear for there's a crown for me oh precious cross, O oh, glorious crown, O oh, resurrection day, ye angels from the stars come down. You can go ahead and remove your communion from the packet and hold it in readiness. Today's meditation comes from Hebrews chapter 2. We must pay the most careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard, so that we do not drift away. Now, there's a myth that some people have that think once saved, always saved. Well, this verse doesn't say that. It's a warning that we do not drift away. For since the message spoken through angels was binding and every violation and disobedience received its just punishment how shall we escape if we ignore so great a salvation this salvation which was first announced by the Lord was confirmed to us by those who heard him God also testified to it by signs wonders and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. It is not to angels that he has subjected the world to come about which we are speaking, but there is a place where someone has testified. What is mankind that you are mindful of them? A son of man that you care for him. You made them a little lower than the angels. You crowned them with glory and put everything under their feet. 
and putting everything under them, God left nothing that is not subject to them. Yet at present we do not see everything subject to them, but we do see Jesus, who was made lower than the angels for a little while, now crowned with glory and honor, because he suffered death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. In bringing many sons and daughters to glory, it was fitting that God, for whom and through whom everything exists, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through what he suffered. Both the one who makes people holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. He says, I will declare your name to my brothers and sisters in the assembly. I will sing your praises. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again he says, here am I and the children God has given me. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity, so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death that is, the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. For surely it is not angels he helps, but Abraham's descendants. For this reason he had to be made like them, fully human in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people because he himself suffered when he was tempted. He is able to help those who are being tempted. Jesus came into this world the same as we did. He was born of a woman. He grew up to become a man. As we just read, he was tempted in every way as we are but yet he did not fail on even one point. Therefore, he knows the struggles we go through every day. Don't ever think that oh, he won't understand. He understands. And he will get us through whatever we're going through. This morning, as we partake, let us examine ourselves. Let us look inside ourselves. Let us look to God above, who provided our sacrifice for us. Jesus was God in the flesh, and he suffered and died upon that cross for each and every one of us. So let us now bow in prayer and prepare to partake of the communion. Dear God, our Heavenly Father, how thankful, Father, that we are to gather together here this morning. We're also thankful, Father, for those who are unable to be here because of the virus or sickness or whatever the case may be that watch on uh, the social media. We're thankful for them as well. And God, as we now prepare to partake of the communion, may we remember Jesus. Remember the pain and suffering and anguish that he went through for each and every one of us because of his love for us and his love for you and your creation. God, we're so thankful that Jesus took our punishment for us willingly gave his life upon the cross for us. He could have called the angels to relieve him at any time, but he withstood all the stripes of the whip, the crown of thorns forced upon his head, forced to carry his own cross through the streets. And through all of this, Father, as he was hanging on the cross, he's asking forgiveness for those who put him there. 
And God, that includes us. Because of us, Jesus had to go to the cross, had to give his life for us. How thankful, Father, we are for Jesus and what he's done. May we now partake of the bread and recognize it as being the body of Jesus. Let us now partake of the bread. And Father, as we continue in prayer, may we recognize the cup as representing Jesus' blood that was shed that day. Through the shedding of his blood, we have forgiveness of sin and the promise of eternal life. Father, how grateful we are for these promises because we know the one that made them is faithful. God, may we always know what's ahead, that even though we, we may die physically, we do not die spiritually. We are here to feed our spirits through this communion service. The emblems do nothing for the body, but only for the spirit. And God, how thankful we are for your spirit. Help us to continue to do your will in our lives. Let us now partake of the cup, recognizing it as the blood of Jesus. And Father, in conclusion, we are so thankful for everyone here and so thankful for those that are watching us on the social media. Please continue to bless each and every one of us. But may we always recognize where our blessings come from because we know that all good things come from you. Father, thank you for all that you do for us. But we thank you most of all for your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Good morning. Uh, scripture is uh, Philippians chapter 1, 3 through 11. I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all, you, all of you, I always pray with joy. Because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. It is right for me to feel this way about all of you, since I have you in my heart for whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and in death and in, of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless until the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Thank you, Damon and Eddie, for the reading today and for the beautiful devotion by Mike and for Amy with her beautiful song. We appreciate all of you who participate in our services and bring us closer to the Lord through what you do in uh, your efforts to honor Christ. It's no secret to those of you who are members at Sharondale Church that my favorite New Testament book is Philippians. There's different ways you can approach the book, and I have approached it in various ways in presenting it, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. Uh, today we're going to 
look at an overall view of Philippians from the theme of Christian living. And each chapter has a word that describes this. And that's what I, how I want to approach it this morning. The purpose of Christian living, the pattern for Christian living in chapter 2, the prize for Christian living in chapter 3, and then the power of Christian living in chapter 4. So we're going to be very focused this morning, and uh, there'll be other verses that will be shared, but I will be using one verse from each chapter to make the point that I want to make this morning. Our theme is Christian living, and I first of all want us to examine the purpose of Christian living. The purpose of Christian living is summed up in chapter 1, verse 21, my favorite verse. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. When the Apostle Paul wrote these words, he was presenting the idea that his aim in life was to live for Christ. Some people live for other things. Some people's purpose in life is to live for their mate. And it's good that husbands and wives want to live for each other and do for each other. But Christian husbands and wives need to first of all live for Christ and then secondly their mate. Some people live for their children and when their children grow up and leave them they feel empty and hopeless. But you see if they're Christians and live for Christ they would always have him. Some people live for their careers. Some people enjoy their careers, and that's good. But there comes a point in time in their lives that they have to leave that career because of retirement or poor health, and then they feel lost. But the Christian person, when they lose their career, they still have Christ. Other people without Christ and God live for pleasure from day to day. But then when those pleasures cease, going from one to the other, and there's no fulfillment, they miss out on a great deal. First of all, heaven, and secondly, the great joy that they can have in the Christian life. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8, the apostle wrote to the church there, we are confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. You see, the, sec the second half of chapter 1, verse 21, is for me to live and to die is gain. And so, in the book of Revelation, we have words that express to us the gain that we will receive in the life to come. I'd like to start with verse number 13 of Revelation 7. Then, these in white robes, who are they? And where did they come from? I answered, sir, you know. And he said, these are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. He's talking about Christians who have overcome this life. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. Never again will they hunger. Never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat down on them, nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb is the center of the throne, will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water, 
and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. The second thing that I want to point out from chapter 2 is the pattern for Christian living. This is what chapter 2 verse 5 says. Your attitude should be the same as that of Jesus Christ. And it was already read to us in the opening scripture this morning by Damon when we read about Christ who it was said in, is in very nature God. He made himself nothing by taking the nature of a servant. And so we are told that we need to have the mind of Christ. We need to have the attitude of Christ. And we know that's a big order because Christ's attitude was always perfect. Mike pointed out from the Hebrew lesson today in our communion that Christ was perfection. He was sinless. And so if we're to have his mind, we've got to think a whole lot different than those without Christ think. We have to think a whole lot different from our selfish motives and think about how Christ's mind worked. What we have here in chapter 2 is two people that the Apostle Paul commends. He really cares for them and he loves them because of the work they did for Christ and the service that they performed for him. One of the men that we see here in chapter 2 is Timothy, a young preacher that was converted by the Apostle Paul on his first missionary journey. And we see the kind of person that Timothy is. He has a servant mind. Notice these words about Timothy. And this is a human person that we can imitate. The pattern for Christian living. Paul said, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon. That I also may be cheered when I receive news about you. I have no one else like him who will show genuine concern for your welfare. Remember I said that Timothy had a servant mind. He cared about people. He wanted to serve people. For everyone looks out for their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. One commentator pointed out, and I never noticed it before, but it's a good way to remember it. He said, we are either like Philippians 1.21 or Philippians 2.21. Philippians 1.21 has these words. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain that we already looked at. Philippians 2.21 For everyone looks out for their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. So you see, Timothy was one who was like Philippians 1.21. He cared about people. And so we see in verse 22, but you know that Timothy has proved himself because as a son with his father, he has served with me in the work of the gospel. I hope therefore to send him as soon as I see how things go with me. And I am confident in the Lord that I myself will come soon. Now there are many people that the Apostle Paul could have sent to the church at Philippi. But he chose this young preacher, Timothy. In other words, Paul sent Timothy to take his place at a church that the Apostle Paul, that I believe, considered his favorite church that he ever started. In the reading that was read to us from the text by uh, 
this morning uh, already by, uh, for the sermon. And I want you to notice something in that. As, uh, we, as Eddie shared these words in the opening of this sermon. Notice what Paul said. I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers, I pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day till now, being confident that he who began a good work and you will carry it on. He says, it's right for me to feel this way about you since I have you in my heart. So he has this great love and affection for the church. And he entrusts this church with this young man named Timothy. Because Timothy had the pattern for Christian living. He had the attitude of Christ. He had the mind of Christ. Paul mentions Timothy 24 times by name in all of his letters in the New Testament, which is about 13 of them. He mentions Timothy by name. That's how much affection he had for him and how much confidence he had for him. Wouldn't you love to be a, a, a Christian that, that God had that much confidence in? That he can just entrust us with anything that he places upon our hearts to do and we will do it? A second person here in this chapter is a minister by the name of Epaphroditus. Epaphroditus was also a wonderful Christian who could be a pattern for Christian living with his balanced life. He says in verse 25, Paul does in chapter 2, but I think it necessary to send back to you Epaphroditus. Epaphroditus was the minister of this church at Philippi, and the church, they could never do enough for the Apostle Paul. Even though they were the poorest church, they were the biggest givers. And they just begged for the opportunity to give more and more. Now they even give their own minister, Epaphroditus, sent him to Rome while Paul was in a prison to minister to him. And now Paul is sending him back to the church. But while he was there helping Paul, he became ill. So this church gave everything. They gave their money. They gave themselves. They gave their minister. They weren't selfish with him at all. This is what it says. But I think it necessary to send back to you, Epaphroditus, my brother, co-worker, fellow soldier, who is also your messenger, that means minister, whom you sent to take care of my needs. For he longs for all of you and is distressed because you heard he was ill. Indeed, he was ill and almost died. But God had mercy on him and not him only, but also on me to spare me sorrow upon sorrow. See how much care Paul had and love he had an affection for Epaphroditus. Therefore I am all the more eager to send him so that when you see him again you may be glad and I may have less anxiety. So then welcome him in the Lord with great joy and honor people like him because he almost died for the work of Christ. He risked his life to make up for the help you yourselves could not give me. And that he means personally, because they always did give him a great deal of money for his work. Let's look at a third thing here. What is the prize for Christian living? Do we do all of this just for a reward? I don't think so. We do this, we're Christians because we know the quality of our life here upon this earth is better. We know that we're going to have peace with God. Our relationship with God is going to be better. We're Christians because our relationship with our fellow man and our families is going to be better. And then, of course, we're Christians because when this is over, we're going to inherit something wonderful. It says in chapter 3 and verse 14 about our prize. I press toward the goal to win the prize 
for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Paul would say in this chapter in verse 20, our citizenship is in heaven. You know, I thank God for my citizenship upon this earth. I'm glad that God gave America to me and I was born in this country. I'm glad that America is my homeland. However, I'm going to be, and right now, I am a citizen of heaven. And as much as I like America, I want to go to heaven. I want that to be where my citizenship is. So we make it our goal to please him, whether at home in the body or away from it. That's what Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 9. Christian living is making it our goal to please him, whether we are at home, in the body, or away from it, in life or in death. That is our goal. Sherwood Wirt had this statement in the minister's manual that I use. And he said, the goal of the Christian is heaven. Nothing more, nothing less, and nothing else. In chapter 4 of Philippians, we see the power of Christian living. Now we know that we want to be good people, like it said there that the Apostle Paul wanted to be his goal to be like Christ. I want to be a good person. I like being around good people. All my life, I've been around good people, even before I came in the church. And I admired them. And even at a young age, I thought, I want to be good. I want to be a superhero. I want to be the one who takes up the uh, mantle for those who are maybe having problems, uh, maybe who are being made fun of. I want to be the one that uh, is good to them when nobody else is. But of course, that big ideal that I had uh, didn't turn out too good because as I was growing up, I found out that I really wasn't that kind to people after all. I wanted to be their hero, but there are times that I wasn't their hero at all. I was just the opposite. I wanted to be good. I wanted to be a good child because I loved my parents, but I found myself being disobedient and disappointing my parents. I found out that it's just not possible to be good enough. However, there is a power in us now as Christians that's going to help us become that. In one word in the scriptures, the Bible refers to us that we are becomers. Now, we're not there yet. Perfection will come eventually, but we're on our way to perfection. And we have the power of this Christian living to do it. In chapter 4 and verse 13, Paul said, I can do everything through him who gives me strength. You see... He's telling us with that verse, I can do everything through him who gives me strength. That us Christians have power within to meet the demands of life. And that power is released when you and I have faith. The beginning of our Christian life is faith. Without it, we read that it's impossible to please God, but it's also the end of our Christian life. And everything in between. Faith isn't just simply one step in the plan of salvation. It's every step in the plan of salvation. Uh, by faith we repent. By faith we confess. By faith we're baptized. By faith we live diligently the Christian life and use everything that in our power to make this life better for ourselves and others in preparation 
for heaven. It's all done by faith, and faith unlocks the door like an older hymn used to say. Prayer is the key to heaven, but faith unlocks the door. So you and I as Christians have to have an increased faith. Is our faith stronger than it was on that day when we confess Christ as our Savior? It should be. It should be a thousand times stronger. But let us grow in our faith because the power is available. We're just not turning it on. This morning I came into this building and it was dark because I was coming in early to do some things and uh, uh, getting ready for the services. And uh, I made my way through. I could see the hall. I can't. I can see once I get in here because whatever light's coming through these beautiful windows, you know, is fine. But uh, in the hall, it's just dark as can be. I mean, I, I'm afraid I'm going to stumble over something, although there isn't much in the hall. But... Uh, you know, there was power available. And, and sometimes I'd just start through the hall and forget to turn on the switch and then get halfway down the hall and realize, boy, I needed that light. All I would have had to do was flip the switch. And all the light that I would need would be available. In our Christian lives, uh, the power of living the life is available. Even though Satan discourages us and doesn't want us to live up to the Christian living that Christ wants us to have, the power is available. And it's not that hard to tap because it's faith. And anybody can have faith. This morning, uh, if you're not yet a Christian and, and you have that kind of faith, the faith that would lead you to confess Christ this morning before these witnesses and to be immersed into Christ so that your sins could be washed away and receive that blessed Holy Spirit, then take advantage of it this morning and step out and accept the Lord as your Savior as we stand together and sing.